welcome to the interesting podcast episode number 182. This episode is with the incredibly talented J.B. Blanc. He's an actor and director who's worked on so many projects across all mediums, from stage to film to voiceover, and he's equally fantastic in all of them. It doesn't make any sense until you hear about all the hard work and dedication it's taken, and it's so inspiring talking to him about his journey. In this episode, we talk about him going to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, teaching in a maximum security prison, misconceptions about what actors and directors actually do, getting the call for the Count of Monte Cristo after quitting acting, moving to the States, working in anime, passing out screaming as the Hulk, his incredible performance as Vander in Arcane, and so much more. JB is such a genuine dude and you are going to love him. Be sure to check him out in the new season of Barry, premiering April 24th on HBO. But before you do that, please enjoy this episode of the Interesting Podcast, number 182, with J.B. Blanc. Theme song time. to adjust once you get there or when you get back it depends on the person some people say it's harder that way some people it's harder this way um yeah. it, I, and it depends what else is going on in your life i think as well because it's just been i just it's kind of like one long time settle and then like this week i've been directing sessions in japan until 10 30 at night and Ooh. it's been just been long yeah goodness gracious do you, yeah. do you have to worry about time differences or do they tell you like it's this time do they calculate it for you yeah, they will calculate it for me, but but uh, yeah, it's uh, we, we do a lot of sessions. So I do a lot of early morning sessions with the UK for for Overwatch and for all the Blizzard stuff that I direct. Sure. Um, and then we've got uh, some new stuff going on in Japan, and so that's that's uh, those are usually late night with that time difference. Oh goodness gracious! Yeah, I feel you. I've done podcasts with people that are in New Zealand, and I'm like, I don't, I don't I don't know what that means. You're gonna have to. Well, yeah, yeah. Then you, you can get sort of roughly close to a civilized hour, but they're at tomorrow and you're at yeah. today. Yeah. I think yeah, it's it's yeah. the future, but I don't. Please, yeah. Please I don't tell know. me how Monday's going. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I always ask them. I'm like, is the world still? Is it still? Are we still a piece? thing? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I've got time. I, I will say, you know, your IMDb page is so long. I got tired before it's I boring. got to the bottom of it. It's, it's boring. I know. I should stop. I should cut stuff. Yeah, it's awful. It's, it's awful. just by I... virtue of being around a very long time and being old. Yeah. <laughs> I'm about to give you a gig at some point. <laughs> That's right. That's why I got tired. I was just sifting for a good thing. And it's just sifting. Yeah. I don't know how you can Very few gold nuggets, weirdly. Yeah. Even, even, I mean, gold, so, uh, it's, it's gener generous. Generous, JB. <laughs> <laughs> but like you said, you've been at it a long time. I remember I, I, I read somewhere that you actually started in theater. Yeah. Yeah. 30 something years ago. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, well, yeah. How, and you were in England at the time. I was in England, yeah. Um, I, I knew, I mean, I was, I didn't, I'm not one of those people that sort of fell into it. I kind of knew what I wanted to do out of desperation and not being able to do anything else quite young. I feel you. Um, I, I wasn't a big academic. I mean, I wasn't stupid, but I was, I just wasn't into it. I didn't mm -hmm. consider the relevance. I feel you. And I went to a sort of English private school, but there were these sort of revolutionary English teachers in there who were like, you know, I think you might be an actor. Little did I know with what they burdened me for the rest of the life. <laughs> yeah. Is like, that an insult? Yeah, I'm like, it's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> um, and then yeah, I did a, a course at the National Youth Theatre when I was 16, and I was just kind of hooked on, on that kind of way of working and, and, and went home and sort of started auditioning for drama schools, but, or started applying for drama schools, but they were, all, they were all done with their auditions for the year. So um, I got a cancellation on the last day of auditions at the Royal Academy. And just kind of what? rolled up, not really knowing what I was doing. I had about three days' notice. I had to get the train down to London because I grew up in rural North Yorkshire. Sure. And just kind of took a punt and then got the, through the first stage and then somehow got through the second stage and got through the third stage. And before I knew it, I was accepted. And I was young. I was like 17. Wow. Uh, probably too young to go to drama school in hindsight. You know, you know, <laughs> yeah. Very little life experience. When you haven't figured out who you are, it's very difficult to figure out how to be other people. True, true. Um, 
but uh, but uh, you know, I got in and that went well, and it was it was great. And then you know, came out and and of drama school, and there was a global recession. It was 1990 or something. Mm. Um, and so I, me and a few friends and and uh, some other drama students from another drama school, Lambda, started a theatre company for for kids who'd recently left drama school, so they had somewhere to work. Oh, smart. Uh, yeah, but we you know we we ate rice for four or five years. And, yeah. <laughs> they borrowed and stole to get money on for productions, but it was, you know, it was some of the happiest time of my career. I was absolutely flat broke, um, but I was doing it. That's when you really find out what you're made of. You know, that's you're doing it for the sheer love of it, and, yeah. and it really tests your commitment. And I think a lot of people will look at a career like mine and think, "Well, he's been working forever. It's been easy," uh, and uh, that's not the case. Mm -mm. It's, uh, the reason is because I've been fighting for thirty years. You know. Yeah. That's what makes the good actors, though, because you have to have that experience, like you said. Yeah, that like, in a traumatic childhood. You know? Yeah, I think so, too. That's it. You know, what? that actually makes me feel way better about where I'm headed. <laughs> it's You've true, just though. given me so much hope, JP. There you go. You see, <laughs> the worse it is, the better it gets. That's right. That's right. You can't give what you don't have. You know, you have to. It's got to be that that. That hurt behind it all. <laughs> it is amazing how many actors come from sort of broken homes. I mean, there are those exceptions out there. Who has, oh, I had a perfect childhood and my parents adored me. And you're like, wow, that's, that must be interesting. Yeah. It's like, I think uh, that's a condition, you know. Yeah. <laughs> can be. Can be. And too comfortable. Don't get too comfortable. Yeah. Don't trust those people. I don't trust anyone who hasn't been devastated at least once. In fact, anyone who's nice to you at all, just don't trust them. You know, exactly. Exactly. There, I find that there's like a, there's a tunnel, right? If you're in the middle of it and they're kind of nice, you're like, oh, I don't know if I trust this. If they're overly nice, it's either A, they're lying. <laughs> or they want or B, they've been on the opposite end that's not so great and they're yeah. actively they're working against it. it. And I'm like, there's the, there's like Yuri Lowenthal. He's one of those. Yuri is, Yuri is and Jennifer bad. Hale, just yeah. genuinely good people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, good, very, very talented people. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I think, that, I don't think they're real. <laughs> like, help me out with this. I've tried. I've prodded Yuri in several places on his yeah. body, and he is, in fact, genuine. Ah, oh, okay, um, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, the, what's What's the sad about the, the the pandemic is that Yuri and I used to have a little supper club, and we'd we'd meet at a nice restaurant and have a meal together, and really catch up every once every two three months if we could. Oh, cool. And we haven't been able to do that for two and a half years. We were talking about it the other day, and I was like, "Come on, man, we got to get this going. This is ridiculous. yeah. Don't let it die. I love I love Yuri very much. There's more prodding. Have you checked the ears? Yeah, I tugged on them hard and they didn't come off. Really? Usually a sign, yeah, especially if they're slightly elven. Yeah, that's yeah. so surprising to me. I tried. God, I tried. Mm. Somehow I trust him less now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't say you should trust him. Right, yeah. That was my bad. <laughs> <laughs> so you're doing, what, like, what is it about theater that drove you in? Because it's such a specific thing to get caught on. Well, I think, you know, I was sort of told that if you want to do this properly, then then the best experience you can get is theater. And I think that's right. true. I mean, it's it's live, it's dangerous. You have to be on your game. Mm -hmm. um, you learn a lot about the craft. You learn a lot about technique. You learn a lot of technical aspects of just vocal production and stuff like that. I mean, I think when I look back, I think the reason I've had a career where I've, you know, I'm one of the lucky ones who've been able to work in lots of different areas of the business. I'm still doing TV. I still get the odd movie. Mm -hmm. when, Someone feels charitable, um, and uh, and and you know the voiceover thing and, and now directing. I mean, I think it's that theatre experience that's given me that sort of broad perspective. You know, when you're doing theatre, you really get into the meat and potatoes of a script. You you know, for, for the first week of a play, you're often just sitting around a table, really chewing out all the details of a script. Things that voice actors don't. And I hate the term voice actors because we're all actors. Yeah. But, you, but when you're working on a game, you really don't get that time. Sometimes on a performance capture project, you know, you'll sit around a table read and really just go over the beat of the scene. Mm -hmm. But you won't get into the nitty gritty. And more often than not, you're getting the scripts as you walk into the booth. Sometimes that's true of me when I'm directing too. You know, I'm seeing the script for the first time with the actor. So wow. what that becomes about, and if you've got experience in, in improv and theater, you, you get very quick at coming up with ideas and at least throwing something at the wall because... If you if you throw nothing at the wall, nothing's going to happen. But if you've got something, even if it's wrong or it's out of left field, but it's something, uh, you've got something to work with. And, and and as a director, I need that from an actor too. Like, bring me something. Um, I'm not here to tell you how to do it. Bring me something and we can mold that. Show me an offer. Be brave. Take a risk. But if you don't do any of that, I can't drag a performance out of an actor. 
And so I think it, I think theatre takes bravery, and I think you learn to be brave. Um, the confidence, you know, I think a lot of a lot of people think actors are supremely confident to be able to go up in front of an audience and do that. But I think a lot of actors I know, and I, probably true of me, was I, I, did, I didn't really like who I was, and so I wanted to be other people. Sure. And um, and I think that sort of the, the the character is the mask that helps you. That that confidence comes from you're not you, you're someone else. You're telling someone else's story. Yeah. And so I think uh, I think getting into that frame set, that mindset, and and, and uh, you know, sad commentary on you kids out there today, but I think everyone's looking for the shortcut. And I think if you look for the shortcut, the career is going to be short um, because you you don't have enough experience to draw on. And and I, I think uh, I, I encourage people to take the long route and train and, 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 and you will have a longer career as a result. And I'm sort of a living example of that. And that, that also that you this is something that you never stop learning how to do. And that's kind of the great thing about it is that yeah. like golf, Tiger Woods can shank one into the trees and so can an actor. Yeah. Uh, and so, and so you're always kind of each job is a new way of learning, a new a new way of figuring out. Each person you work with, each actor I direct, if they're good or if they're terrible, I'm still learning loads from them. As long as I'm open to that learning, yeah. Uh, and I think that's a good attitude to have, and you'll certainly never be bored as a result. That's true. And also, actors are just the good ones are sponges to everything around them all the time. It's a constant state of learning. I found. Yeah, I learned that, you know, once you decide to be an actor, you're never really looking. I mean, and, and you know, I often question whether people are actors who say they want to be actors because they don't think like actors. Or I mean, you know, I was I was taught that being an actor was a privilege, uh, that you were a vessel for a writer, that you were handling this very precious cargo and that you had to take that that what was 2D on the page and make it into a 3D being. Yeah. That's a huge responsibility. Um, it's something that you can never stop. You can never you can never work too hard at it. There's yeah. always something to find. And theatre is great for that because you might run a play for three months. Well, you've got to find something fresh going on uh, every night. No two nights are the same. No two audiences are the same. And you learn to think fast on your feet. Also, things go wrong all the time. So you really learn to get yourself out of a hole. Um, yeah. and, it, and it's a sort of mindset that I think is really good for what we do in certainly the game world because the game world is less naturalistic. It's it's you know, You've got to punch through that mic. You've got to bring a performance. And... Uh, and uh, and you sort of you, the, the writing is the offer. The writer might be in the room, but then you're going yes. And what else can we get out of it? What else is going on? What else can I provide? Uh, how can I give as much variety as possible and still keep the intention of the line? All that stuff that kind of ticks through your brain, which really experience breeds. There comes a stage, I think, in your career where you start going, okay, I don't have to overthink this. I can rely on my instincts a bit more. And you, particularly in game work, you start working off the back foot a bit more easily. You just, you're told to pull shit out of your ass all the time. Excuse my language. Sure. Um, but you get comfortable with that because it turns out your ass is a good place to pull from. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I mean, fine. listen, it's got a lot of experience as an exit. That's all I'm saying. I'm That's picking it. up what you're laying down. <laughs> <laughs> So was there a moment when you're doing theater and then you think back to that teacher and you're like, huh, they were right. Oh, all the time. I mean, listen, bearing in mind that I was very young when I went to RADA, mm -hmm. they throw a lot of crap at you and they, they kind of break you down psychologically a little bit, you, you know, and, and as a young man, that's very, that's or woman, that's very difficult. It's a difficult process to go through. Yeah. Um, and they sort of rebuild you slightly in their image. And I think, you know, as a young, impressionable drama school student, you think, well, their way is the way, and that, well, this is the way. Of course. Um, but actually you realize that that's just one offer, and, and your process as an actor is actually deeply personal, and however you get there, you know, Gary Oldman will tell you that sometimes he puts on a jacket, and that's the role. Yeah. Sometimes it's the makeup, sometimes, you know, so, but, but not to say that that internal work and research isn't going on, but sometimes it's a pair of shoes that makes it click. And so there were, you know, and I, I spent a lot of my time at drama school, having moved down from rural North Yorkshire. I'm suddenly in the big city. I'm gonna have a damn good time. Sure. Um, you know, it was it was uh, I had a lot of fun at drama school. Why not? Um, and uh, you know, I think I nearly got kicked out a couple of times. <laughs> So you um, did it right, is what you're saying. Yeah. Um, and then you know, <laughs> years later, and it could be many years later, you're standing on a stage and go. Oh, that's what he was talking about. I get it. Right. Now I 
But that's what I mean about learning constantly, because and especially in a live environment like this, God, are you learning all the time? Because because yeah, any number of things can happen, and there are a myriad of different types of productions, be they classics or modern or whatever they might be. There might be written in iambic pentameter. It might be poetry. It might be Shakespeare. It might be you know, it could be mammoth, which is its own kind of poetry. Yeah, and, and also you get a broad perspective on writing and I think it was a great training for me to direct because that level of examination of scripts you, you can't skimp you've got to go deep sure and I think one of the complaints we have a lot is that people don't really understand how to interpret text in a lot of the classes I teach when I guest teach at classes mm -hmm. it's it's people not seeing what's in the text and 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 I think you know there are certain people who say listen the words don't matter I disagree entirely the words are everything they're your guide how you make them feel comfortable is the trick. You have to make them feel like they're your own. But that takes that takes experience. I mean, you have to look at a script. You know, nowadays I can look at a script and go, yep, 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 yep. And that's my job uh, yeah. because I've got to help the actor who has zero information whatsoever. Sure. You know. Whew. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, I think people think it's a little, a little more simple than that. Of than course, that. of course, because it's much easier to be like, ah, oh, just be an actor. You're like, oh no, there's a, there's a technique. Just, there's a also, lot. Yeah, I mean, directing. I just tell them how to say shit. No. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's the not, captain that's of the not ship. The game. <laughs> not the game. I know you did you did drama school, and then how did you end up teaching in a prison? <laughs> uh, being an out of work actor. <laughs> uh, I had a friend of mine who was doing a sociology PhD, who was a roommate, and he was like, you know, I, I teach at the prison. They're looking for a drama teacher. Do you want to have a, a go at it? And I was like, and you know, as a, as a theatre actor in England, you do a lot of other crap. Sure. Uh, to money. <laughs> I worked in a cheese shop. I sold rugs on a market. I cleared branches from British telecom lines. Fantastic. I did a lot of, I did, I did construction work. Uh, I used to drive uh, people around to see houses for a real estate agency. Uh, and then something, you know, this sort of steadyish job, uh, uh, ones with prison comes up. Yeah. And, uh, and they look at it, you know, and I don't think they expected a sort of, you know, recent drama school graduate to kind of walk through the door. But I got the job. I got vetted and they didn't find any filth on me because you have to go through, you know, the home sure. office. Security. You hit it well. I get it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. And I worked in a maximum security prison, um, an old Victorian prison, quite Ooh. old fashioned. Uh, but I, it was, again, and one of those amazing experiences that will carry you through life. And the thing, I, one of the main things I learned was like, wow, man, you are just one bad decision from being inside. Facts. You know, First of all, in a prison, everyone's innocent. That's just yeah. a given. Yeah. A given. Oh, I didn't yep. die, sir. You know. Um, <laughs> and also, our last teacher used to bring us a little bit of weed. Do you think you can see your way to doing that? No. Of course. Of that course. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I don't want to be uh, anally searched before I come to work, if that's all right. I'm not going to do, I feel like I'm not going to do my best work if that's what happens. Before, yeah, yeah, different uh, method. Different method. Before I work. Um, uh, but but you know you know I had some rough situations and there were a lot of remand prisoners who were bored and they they get a little tricky. Uh, it was the lifers who were the ones who were who protected me and were on my side. Oh, interesting. Uh, but again, a massive learning experience, you know. And and guys who you know lost their job uh, were were asked to deliver something from one place to other, had no idea what it was, or were delivering a car that was end up end up being packed full of drugs or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And a very sorry place to end up, and and very desperate, and and so, you know, I think as an actor, I think you know a lot of people think, well, I'm going to decide who this person is. No, you have to empathise with who that person is. Mm -hmm. You have to have empathy as an actor. You have to put yourself in their position, and, and and come at it from the inside rather than saying, oh well, that person's. It's like, oh well, that person's the bad guy. I'll play the bad guy. No, but the bad guy doesn't think he's the bad guy. Right, just the right. Guy trying to get his needs met. Yeah, and and I think there's a you know there's a big danger for the the cloak and moustache twirling when people play bad guys. But if you see that if you can empathise with some elements of the bad guy, and that might be difficult. I've played serial killers on TV. I've played all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I'm playing a Chechen thug now on Barry. Uh -huh. um, but you have to you have to find the connection and, and it comes from a place of empathy and sympathy and I think that makes you more of a it's why I never really understand right wing actors I don't really get it because we tell the underdog story right you know, we, we're, we're the little man's representative right we, we're the ones that you know shine that mirror back on society and say look this is how it is what do you think mm -hmm. um, and I think I think you do, you do need a degree of empathy to, to find that and I think 
you know, a lot of people are like, how do you find the roles? Well, I just find where my connection is and, 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 and how I can empathize and see the world from that character's perspective. Yeah. And I think if that's your, if that's your first starting point, I don't think you're going to go wrong. You know, you, if you're coming at it from a point of empathy, I think you can, you can connect and do, do better work. And I think it shows, you know. I think so, too. It makes them human because at the end of the day, we all are. Most of us. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> there are, of course, exceptions. That's right. <laughs> Ooh, a little political. Got a little political there. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> also, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite kind of cheese? My favorite kind of cheese? Jesus. Yeah. I well, get the real I'm, stuff. I'm from the, well, I'm from the southwest of France, and I think Roquefort is the most amazing cheese. Interesting. Uh, and I, I come from the area of France where Roquefort is made, in caves in the Avignon. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I'm yeah, strong blue, like me, strong blue. Yes. Uh, you know, creamy, I can see it. slightly creamy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> deeply French, st occasionally stinky. Uh, you know, I'm that's in. my cheese. Goes great with a glass of drink. And a great, <laughs> great with a good red wine or a dessert wine. Okay. Yeah. There's something about finishing off a meal, finishing off a meal. Because you, you Americans, you have your cheese before the meal. We don't understand that. That's true. That's true. Um, everyone fills up on cheese before they eat. Well, the, the French are like, well, eat my fabulous food. And then if you fancy some cheese, have some afterwards. Ah, a little treat. And then you get into the terrible dietary trap of, you know, oh, I've got some bread left. I'll have some more cheese. Yeah. <laughs> I've got some cheese left. I'll have some more bread. That's right. Trap or gift. Oh, now I've got maybe. bread for it and I need more cheese. And it just becomes a cycle of bread and cheese. And yeah. <laughs> all enormous, I don't know. but We call that living. Yeah, all my family. Yeah, <laughs> all my family live to a ripe old age, almost as ripe as the blue cheese they're eating. <laughs> was, that, was that your favorite cheese before or after working in a cheese shop? <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, the cheese world, you know, fam famously Charles de Gaulle, if you don't know who he was, look him up. He led France uh, around the war and... Um, famously said no to becoming part of the Europe, European Union in France. Uh, he once said, and I'll, I'll misquote it, but it was something like, it is impossible to govern a country that has 500 different types of cheese. <laughs> There's a lot of cheese in France. They take their cheese very seriously. Every region has its own cheese. and it's. Uh, uh, but that's, yeah, I mean, how magical is that? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, Roquefort was probably my favorite because I'm deeply loyal to the southwest of France, but, I mean, there's a myriad of wonderful, wonderful things available. It's a good country, France. Go. It's great. Uh, it's on the list. It's on yeah, the list. Get it. So what, you're doing all these odd jobs. When did you decide to make the jump from stage to screen? Because it's, it's different. It's the same, but it's different. Yeah, it wasn't a decision. It, it just sort of happened. I, I think I did one guest star on a TV show about firemen in London. Perfect. Uh, London's burning. Um, and then... Uh, I was at the National Theatre for, for three or four years, and, and uh, it culminated in two Greek tragedies directed by Sir Peter Hall, who started the Royal Shakespeare Company. Yeah. But I was, I'd done a lot of theatre. I'd only done theatre. I was, it's hard to earn a living. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't really moving above mil, middle-scale roles, and, and that was kind of frustrating to me. Um, you don't make much money even if you're at the National Theatre. It's capped. You know, it's hard. London was getting very expensive, and I was frustrated. And I was tired. I'd had my own theater company. I'd done tours. I'd done, I'd done a lot of kind of gigging. Sure. Some regional theater. And a friend of mine had a web design company. He said, why don't you come and work for me? If you've ever seen an interview with me before, you've probably heard the story, so I apologize. Um, why don't you come and work for me? I'll give you a regular salary in a car. And honestly, just in the place I was, completely misguidedly, and let this be a lesson to you kids, I quit. I, 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 I decided to hang up my gloves as an actor for a bit and uh, went to work for this web design company, thereby immediately entering the corporate world of office politics, uh, very, mm. not quite Dunder Mufflin, but close. And, I, I, you know, actors have to have high aptitude. That means you have to learn stuff very quickly. You need to ride a horse, you're going to learn to ride a horse. You need to fight with a sword, you're going to fight, fight with a sword quickly. And so I learned the business pretty quickly and, and with I was quickly selling multi-million dollar strategy, web strategies to British Telecom and, and Channel 4 and people. And then Ooh. I became kind of accounts director of the company. I had the salary and I had the nice car. And I wanted to stab myself in the eye with a fork. I bet. I was very, very unhappy. And um, and it was two and a half years. And, uh, and oh. true story, I came home from work one day from the office and sat on the couch and went, what the hell have you done? You've lost all the passion you had in your life. You've given up what you loved most. You've now lost all your contacts. You don't have an agent anymore. What the hell are you going to do? And the phone rang. And I was literally having that kind of crisis. And the phone rang, and I picked it up, and the voice said, Hi, 
uh, can I speak to JB? And I said, yes, speaking. And she said, hi, JB, it's Priscilla John. Do you remember me? Priscilla John is one of the biggest casting directors in, in London. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I remember you, Priscilla. What's up? She goes, you still working? Yeah. Yeah, I am. Why? She goes, I don't know. There's this movie, The Count of Monte Cristo. The director's coming in the town. He wants to meet some actors. I think there might be some stuff in there for you. Do you want to meet him? And I... And the reaction in my body was so physical and emotional. I mean, it was just like, oh, my God, I've been given a lifeline. Yeah. And so I hastily said yes. And uh, I, I went for lunch at her house, which was very incredibly kind of her. She literally, literally changed my life. Um, and I met Kevin. We got on well. I auditioned for him. And he's like, you know, directors in England don't say that an actor's a good actor. It's considered, it's going to make them arrogant. They just don't tell you you're good. They'll go, yeah, I was fine. And you go, yes. <laughs> um and Kevin was like, he's from Dre Driver from Texas. He's like, you're a really good actor. Why haven't you worked more? And I said, I, I just haven't had good representation or, or luck. And he there went, yeah, that, that does make a difference, doesn't it? Well, I want you in my movie. And I was like, then great. And originally, I think, you know, he he, he would have liked to be to, to have done the, the, or one of the options was to do the Luis Guzman part in that movie, which was sure. a great part. But, you know, who's going to attract the money, Luis Guzman? Much more sure. than I am, the, than J.B. Who. Mm -hmm. um, but I got this great little role of Luigi Vampa, and and we shot that in Ireland and Malta, and uh, you know that was a that was a hell of an experience. Again, fast learning experience. Dropped in the deep deep end. First major role in a in wow. a movie. First major scene in a movie. I'm on a beach in Ireland with Jim Caviezel. Um, you know the lights going. They've organised a fight for two right-handed fighters, and Luis is left-handed, so they've rearranged the fight. We're running out of time. I've got my first scene uh, in, in a movie. It's a long, a longish scene. Um, I'm crapping myself, and you know, I've got to deliver yeah. it. That was a big learning experience. We shot that in Ireland, and we shot in Malta, and then Kevin was like, "I think you'd do better in the States. Why don't you come over and and have a look and see what you think?" And so I did. I came over for ten days in like, I think May of '01, mm -hmm. and thought sunshine, palm trees. And when I called call up casting directors. They'd say, "Oh, let me take you to lunch." I'm like, "I'm in the Count of Monte Cristo," and they're like, "Well, let's let's we, we need to meet," which was very different it. from England. It was like, you know, in England, casting directors were slightly afraid of meeting new actors. It, they wanted their stable, and that's all they wanted to to operate. Whereas in, in in America, the business is a business. It's a business. And, yeah. And I always felt in England it was a bit of a lottery, and I was just kind of chucking the dice, and I owed someone a favor if I got a job. Whereas here. If you understand yourself as a marketing proposition, you can really work on putting that forward, and there are categorical things you can do. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of, I sort of turned around and came back, you know, and uh, and tried to make a go of it. Uh, and I, I stopped in New York to see friends, did some tourist stuff in New York, uh, came here on September the first or August the 29th, two thousand and one, and ten Ooh. days later the towers went up. Yeah, and the world changed very quickly. <laughs> The movie yeah. got pushed. Um, I didn't really have any options back in the UK. I had to try and make this work. It was a very difficult time, very I weird. Bet. And I had to kind of patiently wait for the movie to come out and, and see what happened. But, you know, then it came good, and uh, the movie did okay, but it's it's become a movie that people love. Um, mm -hmm. And I was very lucky. You know, I was a character that, that popped up on screen after two characters had been in prison for 14 years in a very long time. Right. And so they were like, oh, <laughs> character, this is good. That's right. <laughs> people noticed that. And then uh, they were looking for British voices for a Japanese dub. And I'd never done any voiceover, really. And, and uh, oh. there was this gig called Helsing. And, and, I, right. and I kind of turned up and, and got the parts. And that was my first foray into voiceover. Was was I cut my teeth on anime for a few gigs, and then games started happening at the same time, really taking off and actually requiring better acting for games, which was great. Sure. And it kind of it kind of just started from there. And I met Troy Baker in a session, and I'll be eternally grateful to him because he was like, "You're good. You 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 need to meet this person, this person, this person, this person, this person." And introduced me to a, a rash of directors who then hired me, which was amazing. Bless you, Troy. Thank you. Yeah. Although he's not dead, I don't know why he's, he's right. really alive and well. He can well, hear but... us, JB. <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, and and it sort of kicked off, and then I I got my first TV gig, which was playing a guy, a Greek guy from New York uh, in NYPD Blue, the last season of NYPD Blue. That shows how old I am. Fantastic. Um, and my TV a TV sort of got up and running at the same time, and and so, you know, perseverance, um, 
mm-hmm. just keeping, keeping, just keeping, just not quitting and not giving up. It was, you know, it was a good year before I did anything. Yeah, and then, you know, and then I, I got on a roll and, 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 you know, I think I was always into dialects and stuff, so I could give lots of different varieties of performances. I could get multiple roles in games and stuff. I was a... I was a good, a better sell because of that versatility. Let that be a lesson to you, kids. Right. Um, have as much in your back pocket as you can. Um, and now I'm, you know, 300 games down the line, and I started directing, and it just, it, everything kind of just went from there. That's Not quite sure how, how it just kind of just. Did. How was it going from like? Because it is a different medium. When you go, you did stage, and then your first movie is Count of Monte Cristo. That's wild. But then doing anime, that's like the hardest voiceover gig because you're dubbing yes as anime fans were never hesitant to point out to me i remember <laughs> my i did a, i did a <laughs> my first convention was was you know the lion's den anime expo in los angeles Ooh. and i did a panel we did a helsing panel and, and a guy got up and he went um i have a question for mr blanc um <laughs> uh, you've done i see from your resume lots of film and television and theater um what makes you think you could do anime oh no what a pointed question! I knew I was in trouble. Yeah, and like you know, and, I, and the, moder- the moderator was like, "Oh, did it be? and I was like, "No, I'll take it." And I was like, "Listen, uh, you know, your job as an actor is to work in is to be prepared to work in as many media as possible." Yeah. Um, and and cast a wide umbrella to catch all the raindrops. Um, so so when I was going to work on anime or when I was going to audition for anime, I I read a lot about anime. I studied, you know, about anime and about some of the lore and about the 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 history and the facial expressions and the eyes and the you know all the stuff that I because I'm not some two fly two bit fly by night guy who just showed up and thought well I'm gonna do anything sure. this wasn't an accident a lot of thought and preparation went into it yes there is no substitute for hard work and dedication absolutely um, I didn't know anything I don't know anything about a lot of the things that I've done in my life for the first time but I'm brave enough to 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 figure it out and try and approach it in a smart way and do the best job I possibly can whilst honoring the medium that I'm working in, hopefully. Yeah. Occasionally dishonoring it, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, it's the yin and yang of it all. I get it. Yeah, I respect you're it. You're a man that was in Garfield, A Tale of Two Kitties. I'm done. I'm right. ashamed. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, uh, but, you know, it's, it's so, so to me, it was all part of the job of being an actor. Yeah. Uh, is to adapt. And, and yes, they are different medium medias, but, but you have to look at each one individually and figure out how to do it. Uh, as best you can and and yeah you turn it down for film and you turn it down for television and yeah there are a million different genres of games from fantasy to very naturalistic stuff you know the last of us is very different to shadow of mordor or or you know and and then you've got sort of mixture of, of sort of naturalism with fantasy like like uh, horizon zero dawn right you know that takes that takes some very close tender uh, work to work and to build those emotional relationships because and and as acting as, as 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 games have gotten more technology technologically viable and and uh, and realistic, you know the performances have had to, the performances, the directing, all of it has has had to kind of pitch up to that. Yeah. And and you need to be a damn good actor to be a video game star these days. And so that's why I say get the training, do the do it the right way. Get get keep working, keep working on your your craft, which is an overused word, but. But the job of acting, you know, and it is a job, um, but it doesn't mean that you can't keep on the ball and keep working hard to be better. You should always be working hard to be better. I agree. So when you have Pakun in Naruto and yeah. Komamura in Bleach, what's the key yeah. to playing a dog? <laughs> <laughs> well, he was, you know, it was very clear that he was sort of grumpy, don't mess with me. And, and, and uh, the, the, I think part of it was the Napoleon, the Napoleonic complex of the dog. He's a very sure. small dog. Um, and you know, some of the first lines I think I ever did were things like, don't call me puppy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, so that, that gave me a very kind of like, if I gave this dog a very kind of butch voice, uh, don't mess with me, you know, and, and he was always slightly, slightly disgruntled to be called upon. Yeah. <laughs> they went this way, they went that way. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, it just, you know, again, it's like, okay, well, what's the, what's the angle? What's the instinct? What's the... It's stuff you build up over over time, and, you, and, and there'll be an element of a character that speaks to you. But it's also a collaboration with the directors of of that too to figure out how you're going to do it. And that's true of anything. You know, I don't want my bane to sound like anyone else's bane. So, sure. I tell this story a lot when I turned up to do Arkham uh, Origins, uh, mm-hmm. a big game, and and uh, I didn't know what game I was working on, didn't know what character I was playing. 
Um, and I walk into a booth and there's Troy and, and Roger Smith and, and they're like, do you know what this is? And I'm like, no. And they're like, oh, dude, you're playing Bane in Arkham Origins. I was like, what? <laughs> and, uh, and you know, oh, oh, oh. but in those first five, ten minutes of a session, I had to come up with a character that I was going to be playing for over a year on and off, you know, while we engineered the game together. So y y y learning how to form a character in quick time, you know, making making decisions that are appropriate, risky, but brave, but 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 fit. That's sure. the game, you know, and, you, and that takes experience. And, and when you've broken down a thousand theater roles, you have that experience. That's not really, you can't really replace that, you know. You'll get away with busking it for a certain amount of time. Right. But ultimately, you've got to learn your music theory, you know. Um, and, and that's the detail. That's the, that's the hard work. And I do think people are slightly afraid of that. I've had kids who've asked to be trained by me, and we've broken down one script, and they've just done a runner. Because they're like, I didn't, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't realize I was going to have to work. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you, didn't, you didn't think, I see. Okay, well, I can't help you then. Sorry. Right. And, and you know, I'm no great sage. I, my ass was kicked when I was that age. Right. You know, I thought it was easy, too. I thought, oh, yeah, you just, you just do this thing. And, you know, very quickly they corrected that and said, Lou, this is, this is a life. It's not a job in the same way that other jobs are. It is a life. Yeah. And that was the other thing I was going to say about being an actor is that if you're truly an actor, you don't walk around the world the same way ever again. You don't sit in a restaurant the same way again because you're watching. Look at that couple. My God, they're together and they hate each other. He's lying to her because he's touching his ear while he's telling her the story. That's fascinating. You're observing that behavior and understanding that that it's all information that you can use. You just don't. It's it's it, it sounds sanctimonious. It's not sanctimonious. It's your job. Yeah. It's your job to observe and, and take in that information and be detailed. Generalizations in this business are a sure way to failure. It's just bland. So be specific, be detailed. And that's yeah. what you get from life experience and from observing life properly, I think. I agree. Isn't that weird that like it is a mileage thing? Like It's a skill, but it takes mileage to get it. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. The ones that, that seem to just have it, they're yeah. rare birds. Yeah, they're rare birds. That's a that's a very unique, and there are kids out there who will blow anyone off the stage, mm -hmm. or off the screen. That's largely because they're unfettered by human conditioning. They they just respond purely. Children respond very purely and emotionally to immediate situations. Right. The older we get, the more baggage we carry about our stupid lives and our concerns and our love of chocolate or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. uh, that complicates things, and it's harder to pare that away and find your emotional truth. Um, so. You know, it's a it's a lot of it's a complicated it's a complicated business. I mean, I can talk about it for hours, and I clearly am. I love it. Doing, so I'm going on and on, but I'm probably boring. But not to but, me. Um, it's a complex it's a complex subject, you know. And I think I think you know, like a lot of things, it's not about what you think it's about. But right. to me, that's beautiful. That's wonderful. That's great. Agreed. Gives me that much more respect for it when you start realizing all the ingredients. Yeah, that's the adventure. It isn't. I, I think it's true of a lot of things to to look at someone, a tennis player, and say, well, they're great at tennis. No, they've worked really bloody hard to be good at tennis since they were five years old. Yeah. And every nuance and angle of the racket is, is pertinent. The, the, the pressure, the swing, the body, the power, the, the timing, everything. It's so much more complex than it looks on the surface. Yeah. So I, always, I have a huge respect for athletes because you kind of are that as an actor. You've got to train. You've got to work hard. You've got to keep current. You've got to keep fresh. You've got to look for new techniques. You've got to look for new information. You've got to watch a lot. You've got to observe other people a lot. Um, and you've got to be open to always learning. It's a, it's a lot to take on. It ain't big and big, but it's a lot to take on. But also, I think you don't have a choice. I think actors, you, you just there's an innate thing that you just have to, you don't get to pick. Some, uh, you know, some people, you know, well, some, I mean, some people just, you know, do it for a lark and I think they quickly get found out. Right. Um, and, and then they get the shock in their career where it's like, oh shit, am I serious about this? Am I going to really do this? Because right. it is a big decision and you're going to make a, you're going to make a decision that's going to render you broke for a lot of your life. You're going to hear a tremendous amount of rejection. You're going to, you're going to enter into a serious competition. Although in the voiceover world, that is less, um, it's less aggressive. Mm -hmm. It's more accepting. We help each other out a lot more. We're much more of a, uh, a a kind of cooperative, I think, in the voiceover world because there isn't the same degree of paranoia about what you look like. It's it's right. really we, people really recognise the sheer talent that is required to do this. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, you know, if I don't, if I can't go do a gig, there's five people I'll recommend who who I would happily happily give the job to, uh, and hopefully they would do the same for me. And it, so it's much less cutthroat. But it is it is an undertaking, and I say you know it's it's a life as well as a job, and and. You know, I think a lot, and I respect people who go. You know what? It's not for me. I, I, I don't have that. You know? Sure, I don't have that, but I don't have the propensity to wear a suit and tie. Yeah, I feel you. You know, so that's that's the flip side. Different strokes for different folks. Yeah, and and you've got to get comfortable with not really knowing how your life's going to be, and when you want to settle down and marry and have kids, that takes that's hard. It's yeah. hard for any partner to understand. You know, mm -hmm. when my kid was a year old or, or six months old, I suddenly got a job in Texas, and it's the next day I'm leaving for ten days. Right. And your wife is like, "Uh, yeah, okay, that's the life." Yeah. You know, or they're not, and they can't handle it, and it, you know, it's very tough. And so a lot of people do go, you know, that's just that's just not for me, and I totally respect that. Yeah, same. And uh, hopefully, it's one more job for me. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't leave food on the table, JB. I get it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I've been I've been gathering Fred's Fred Tattershaw's crumbs for most of my career. That's right. Um, you know what? You think I didn't realize you were also the voice of the Hulk in the Ed Norton movie? It's been done. Yeah, yeah. Me and Fred did that. To, that was a that was a gig, man. That, how, uh, how does that even happen? Well, it's it's a looping gig. Uh, you know, oh, it's a cool. looping it's a looping gig. You you they wanted they wanted actors with big voices, and Fred and I and a couple of others did it. Um, again, it's a it's a great sign of not knowing what's involved. They wanted us to scream for one point at for for twelve to fourteen seconds as Hulk, Ooh. which anytime you're screaming in a bass voice is you're very open to damage. Yeah. Um, I it's one of the only gig I've ever done where I coughed up blood. Good God! Both Fred and I blacked out doing the scream. Because you lose you lose oxygen in your brain because yeah you you just you can't breathe. Um, and it's kind of naive because you can you can take bits and layer them and, and ex you know you, you don't really have to make an actor do that. Sure. But there's a great example of you know people not understanding what's actually involved and then they layered it with animal noises and all kinds of other stuff. Sure. But that was Fred and I both reminisce about that quite often about being one of the toughest gigs we either of us have ever done, Ooh. and certainly I've never been put in in physical jeopardy like that before. Right. Uh, so that was a tough one. That's wild. Yeah. It, yeah. It it takes a, a speaking of like making decisions and stuff like that. When did you decide to go into like directing? Because it's one thing to be an actor, but it's another to like I'm going to drive the ship kind of thing. Yeah, I um well I uh it was it's sort of I was asked to. Cool. I was asked to. It wasn't really a decision. I'd sort of maybe I'd had one eye on it eventually. Mm -hmm. Um I, I I was starting to teach a little bit, but again, you know, I'd been doing it 20 years when I started to teach. Right. Or 15 years. Um, I have to say there are people out there teaching now, and I kind of look at them and go, where's the experience that means that you can teach? You need a lot of experience. I would never have dared to teach unless I had a lot of stuff under my belt, because otherwise, mm -hmm. how can you trust my perspective? I think a lot of people think that they have knowledge that they don't actually have. And, and teaching is one of the biggest, like, it's got to be handled so delicately. You're really dealing with people's souls. Yeah, it's 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 a very uh, the responsibility of being a teacher is something that needs to be highly highly respected, just as a not a, not in terms of a person but as an art as a form of 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 passing on knowledge. Yeah, and and I think to to make the decision to teach too early is a dangerous thing, um, and and. Uh, I personally wouldn't have even considered it unless I'd been doing it a while. So I'd started teaching a while, and I was dialect coaching because dialects were kind of my thing. Mm -hmm. And then um, Karen Fishman was the producer at Warner Brothers, and I'd been doing a lot of voices for them over the years. And they they said, "Look, we've got this game, Middle Earth: Shadow of Mordor. We think you'd be the right guy to direct it. Um, you want to give it a go?" And I bit her arm off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I first went, holy shit, am I ready? I mean, yeah, that's, I bet. that's a big undertaking. Huge. Um, I wasn't doing the performance capture, but I was doing all the rest of the voices, all the orcs, all of the... And, you know, part of it, part of it was, was they kind of got a director and a dialect coach in, in, in the same bag with a lot of British voices that were required. Right. But not to do myself too damn too much. But, um, but, but you know, what do you know? I didn't screw it up, and, and that went well. And then... Um, what happened after that? Well, then they, they asked me to direct Lego Batman Beyond Gotham, Lego Batman 3. Then I did Lego Dimensions, which was an enormous game. I got to direct people like 
uh, J.K. Simmons and uh, uh, Gary Oldman was my lead villain. What? I got to direct Gary Oldman. Yeah, I mean, What's I was, your life was very at quickly point? in the. Oh, dude. <laughs> I've directed Snoop Dogg. Come on, man. Dude. I mean, now it's it's like, you <laughs> know, that's the medical. There you go. <laughs> Snoop Dogg and The Rock are two of my latest directing. Dude. Um, so, so, yeah, so, again, you know, it was like, you know, I think the other thing I'd say about it is that, that you, you know, I think a lot of people are trying to project their career and trying to see where it's going to go. I, I think it's dangerous because, yeah, you have that in your mind, have goals, have ambitions, but it, sometimes it can take, it can make you take your eye off what's immediately in front of you, and that's really your most important job. That's what you can control. Is what right. is the job that you're doing in that second, that moment. And I think, you know, I think some people go, "Oh, I've been offered a directing gig. I'm going to be a massive director." And I, I never ever thought that. I was like, "I'm only as good as my last gig." And that theatre again had taught me that. It's on record. It's it's there. It's indelible. It's like yeah, you you know, that's what you shall be judged by, and therefore. You know, I have an in a pretty intensive focus when I'm directing on, on what this project is at this time, and I'm not really thinking, okay, what am I going to do next? And so I, th I sort of job to job, and then 2K he heard of me, and I, I ended up directing XCOM 2 and, and Mafia 3 for them. Um, Epic got a hold of me, and I got started on, on Fortnite, which was right at the, the, the sort of the beginning of Fortnite, the story mode. Yeah. Um, still directing Fortnite. Um yeah. Guys at Riot got a hold of me because I was doing League of Legends and I, I directed Legends of Runeterra and Blizzard. And the, the big change was really Blizzard. Andrea Toy is bringing me in at Blizzard. Yeah. Um, that really changed everything because Blizzard is a marathon. Blizzard is, you know, I'm currently working on, I think, seven projects for Blizzard right now. Ooh. Because of them, I work every day of my life, which is always what I always wanted as an actor. I didn't necessarily yeah. achieve it as an actor, but I'm still managing to juggle directing voice acting i hate the term but acting for for uh, games and, and animation mm -hmm. and uh, and and a tv career so uh i i'm i'm really very 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 fortunate i i, I don't know about lucky because i think that takes away from the sheer hard work that's involved agreed but i am very fortunate and and i'm fortunate that people have trusted me i'm fortunate that and very grateful that actors trust me um i think that it helps again because you know, this is, goes back to the thing of teaching teaching and directing before you can do that. Right. I've been through just about every situation you can go through as an actor, and especially in the booth. Yeah. And so they kind of know I've got their back, and I'm, I'm not going to steer them wrong, and I'm going to help them when the, when a problem... Because there are lots of pitfalls in this business, and there's lots of hurdles you have to come across, and there are lots of blocks that happen. Mm -hmm. I can help them get through that because I've been there. And I, and I hope that they do trust me for that. And... Um, and so, you know, that's really that's really how it kind of it kicked off. And uh, and then, you know, last year I got I got approached by Activision to direct the next Call of Duty, and I did Call uh, Call of Duty Vanguard, mm -hmm. um, which you know the story mode was a big hit, and uh, and uh, and I had an amazing bunch of, of of actors. I was given an enormous amount of trust. I had a team that backed me up to the hilt, just like couldn't have been more supportive. I, they involved me in the writing and the casting. It was an amazing experience. Cool. Um, and, you know, good old Laura Bailey's just been nominated for a BAFTA for it. So. <laughs> Rightfully so. Fabulous, you know, and that's that's great. Um, and she did me a solid. We lost an actor, and I was like, who the hell can do this at short notice? <laughs> and I was like, Laura Bailey. And they were like, you're not going to get Laura Bailey. And I was like, let me call you back in 20 minutes. There you I go. Called, I called Laura, who's an old, old friend. She's not that old. I'm a yeah, lot right? older. <laughs> but, uh, see, I've known her a long time, and I was just like, I need your help. And uh, uh, we're in a situation, and you're the only person I know who can really step in and nail this. And she agreed, and, and uh, that made me look very good to Activision, which was great. There um, you and go. I, have, I haven't used that at all. Uh, sure, yeah. <laughs> not, no, I would never take advantage of that. Um, no, definitely but, not. No, no, no. But but you know that you know directing performance capture was like being back in the theater again. It was. Yeah. It, was, it is. It's directing film and theater in, uh, at the same time, and that that to me is tremendously exciting. I want to do more of it. I want to do more of it tomorrow. It's yeah, it really fun. Do you have a preference, like uh, as far as because obviously any work is work and it's great, but like yeah, you have, I, I, like... I have I have a, a very strong preference for my kids' college fees. Ah, fair. That's no, fair. I'm not as I'm not just mercenary. Listen, my preference is what I've got. I'm so yeah. lucky. I get to do a bit of everything. Yeah, you I do. Mean, a, a lot of everything. Every time I kind of, I think, you know what, maybe I'll hang up the acting gloves now. 
something comes up. Barry came out of nowhere, you know. Yeah. Um, season three, April twenty fourth, folks. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it but it came out of nowhere, and I and I was literally kind of like, you know what? I think I'm done. I, I don't think I can do this anymore. It's tough on camera now. Yeah. Um, and the business has changed. No one really wants to work hard to get you work. Mm -hmm. It's tough, and you know, trying to get an agent is bloody impossible. Yeah. They want you to have a show before you've got them. I'm like, if I had a show, why would I need you? Yeah. Um, you know, so it, it, it's it's demoralizing. And I don't find the voiceover world demoralizing. I find it really positive. It's endlessly growing. The game industry is massive. What's being achieved, the new levels of stuff that are happening, what the metaverse represents, yeah, what tokens represent. It's exciting where it's going. And so, I mean, how lucky am I, man? Damn, you know, I think, people, you know, what do you, what do you like doing better? I like doing all of it. Yeah. Because why would I look a gift horse in the mouth? It's amazing. Agreed. You know, it's a fun ride. It's it's stressful and it's hard and I work incredibly. I'm up at five every day and I usually done by about 10 or 11 at night. Yeah, it's it's it takes that. And, you know, occasionally I walk downstairs and my teenage daughter says, who the hell are you? Have you got any food? Right. <laughs> and that's the relationship I want with my children, really. Right. You know, that's, I think it's heartwarming. It's heartfelt. I'll tell you a funny story. I had a very difficult session the other day. Very difficult. It was a very taxing session. Working remotely as a director has been very hard because you don't have that face to face with the actor, and, and sure. you've got to kind of concentrate four times as hard. And I think all of us who've been directing remotely would say it is doubly exhausting because just the mental focus you need to have is sure. huge. Um, it's why I dose myself with all sorts of fabulous drugs to cope. Um, do what you got to do. <laughs> don't do it, kids. Just say no. Um, and and I'd had a particularly hard session, and I came downstairs and. My kids, who the hell are you? <laughs> Have you got any food? And I, I made her some food, and I thought I'll sit down and I'll just, I'll just catch MSNB. I'll catch the news before I go back up and do my auditions for the next day. And I sit down in my chair, and um, the next thing I wake up and it's like one thirty in the morning. I'm like, God, gee, what the fuck? I'm still <laughs> in the chair. I was just out, and that was like eight thirty or nine o'clock. Uh, and I was like, I saw this little thing out of the corner of my eye, and I looked at my chest, and there was a tiny little torn out piece of envelope on my chest, and on it it just said, Good night, Dad with a little oh. love heart. Oh, the heart melts. I know, I was Ooh. in bits. And it's like, it's like, you know, if I've got a, that kind of relationship with my teenage daughter and I, she lives with me uh, uh, alone. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's, that's not, if I can salvage that after with, with everything else that I have to do, then I'm doing okay. This that's is, I'm so a happy special. man. It was great, it was really great. I Don't get me wrong, that. she's a royal pain in the ass. The worst. But I love her. The worst. Yeah, I, I mean, her. she's, she's your daughter. She's a seventeen-year-old daughter. I mean, Jesus Christ! Yeah, you know, it's it's very weird suddenly becoming the guy that is, you know, at ten thirty at night or eleven is stuck in the aisle in, in CVS scratching his head trying to find the organic feminine hygiene products. Yeah, that's not how I saw my life. This is the reality, guys. This is I. That's my life. It's not yeah. just. It's not the glamour of show business, you know. That's um, right. <laughs> that's the reality. I love it though. I love it. You got to juggle it all. Speaking of. Uh, great father figures a career best performance in a career that's been great across the board dude vander first i just watched the show made me cry thanks told my brother he's an he's like an army vet and he's like this is the greatest show i've seen in a while i'm like i know right <laughs> so then your scene specifically i've watched so many times because the performance is i don't know what you did but it was next level incredible work you're very generous, thank you. It's fact. Well, you know, I just told you what I did, which is, wh where's the connection with the character? Yeah. I happen to be a father of a daughter who's been through a lot in her life. Sure. I've been through a lot in mine. I get, I get difficult childhoods. Yeah. Um, I, I also get people with a past, you know, teaching mm -hmm. in a prison. Uh, people you. trying to make good, you know, my, me getting my shit together to be a better person, a better father, and not lark around drinking, doing drugs, and having fun. Sure. Um, you know, that's... And just, I think... I'm going to be careful, because I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but I think having the wisdom to attack a character like that with sensitivity, and also having a team who really knew what they were looking for, and, and, and being able to... And, and were generous enough to really encourage input from me uh, very early on i first recorded on that show seven years ago i mean that's a long time wow ago. well yeah it went through a lot of iterations huh. um and it went through a lot of cast changes too and and 
me and Jason Spees used to call each other and go, dude, are you still in this show? Because I don't know. If I'm, I, just, I've heard they've just recast like three people. And I, it's like, used to, I don't know. If it's, I mean, I haven't heard anything in a year. Is it happening? I don't know what's going on. Keep your head down. Keep your head down. Somehow, yeah. Just don't say anything because otherwise you get fired. Yeah. Um, somehow we both we both managed to last. But, you know, Van, you know Vander, Vander was someone I could very much identify with, you know. Um, I, 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 and I knew that he had to have a sort of calm resolution about him because he was in a very difficult position. Yeah. Um, uh, but yet again, you know, spoiler alert, turn off now if you haven't seen the show. Yeah. Um, yet another lovable father figure who doesn't make it very far. No. Rost, Ooh. prof in Star Wars Jedi for uh-huh. the uh, v- Vanda, it's happened again and again and again. I think, you know, the, the industry has now got a nickname for me. It's Tutorial and Die. Yeah. <laughs> And I just, I, you know, it's not, it's, I don't mind. I just, I'd appreciate more session fees. Sure. <laughs> Can I have a character that lives? Right. You're too good. That's the problem. <laughs> we got to, you shine bright, you know, brightest star but shine. Again, you know, you see that artwork. You see the, the these two young guys who came up with this concept um, had no idea what they were doing at the beginning, but God, they had passion and they knew they, knew they wanted to make something that was very special, that honored the, the fans, that honored the, the lore. Um, Hello, um, and, and and that was made with with heart, and by God, it was made with heart. I mean, I've never. I'll just give you an indicator. I mean, I've never done anything where you know, if you're doing an animation session, there's no animation done. Very rarely is there any animation done. Right. There are sort of jerky sketches of scenes, sure, um, and the scripts, and and they animate to your voice, which is, I think, one of the great honors of doing that work. Yeah, I. It's rare that they preview a scene in a session. You're standing in a booth on an industrial state in Glendale. They preview a scene. And at the end of it, I've got tears running down my face. And then I'm supposed to act the scene that just made me cry. Yeah. And that doesn't happen very often, you know? It doesn't happen very often. It's not often that a piece has that kind of tug. Uh, and so I knew whether it was successful or not it was a dream job that's i mean that's there's very little animation that can do that that powerfully yeah particularly when it's adapted from a game it just doesn't happen so they've done something very very special there and i hope it continues and and is is massively successful uh and if there's a part for me i'm available yeah (laughs) we know you've got range you're the most ethnically ambiguous actor i've ever seen (laughs) I'll take that as a compliment, I think. It is. It is. I've seen you play an Albanian. I've seen you play a cartel doctor. I've seen you play a, a, a pirate. Yeah. 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 That, I know, you know, it's a bloody stupid thing to do for a living. I yeah. <laughs> but I'm not something anyone can do. I'm very I'll, confused. I'll blow the trumpet. <laughs> Confusion is my ally. Yeah. <laughs> an ally that you have figured out to become best friends with, and it works. There you Whatever go. it is, I there you go. love your work. It's Bless genuinely... You inspiring is the word thank you very much just trying to put one foot in front of the other and keep going well dude we've been talking for an hour already you survived that was great it was much easier than i thought it was going to be yeah (laughs) i still have all my fingernails it's great that's right that's for the next session it's it's like a (laughs) lull you into it the screws really go on yeah (laughs) but before i release you into the wild i gotta ask where can people find you online where can they find your things uh, I have a website, jvblog.com, which is kind of still being finished. Uh, uh, I'm on Twitter, at the JB Blanc. I'm on Instagram, at the JB Blanc as well, I believe. I'm around. You know, it's not hard. You Google something, you'll trip over me. Um, but uh, but I would like to big up season three of Barry, which I, I hope you will enjoy. And is, I have some fun stuff in there, and it's going to be a, a gas. It's going to be a fun fun ride. Uh, that's coming out soon, and and uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, just just thank you, man. Thanks for taking an interest. Thanks for giving a shit. Of course, of course, and I give a lot. So sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Gives lots of shits. That's right, actors, I right? It. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey.
Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. There you'll find my demos, films, and a bunch of other really fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to pick you up some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly and get early releases of the shows, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Daryl, Daz, Ben, Victor, Jim, and Chris. Your support means so, so much to me, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.